Ephesians chapter 9, 14. Let's first open a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. We thank you that it's perfect and flawless. Use this time in a way that would please you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Romans chapter 9, verse 14. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. I get 2 Peter 3. I want to look at those two passages together. And just to give you an overview of what we're going to do, I'm going to first introduce and define what the uh, great delay principle is. And then there are four specific examples in the Scripture that I want to cover with you. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3. Knowing this first, there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. So let's take these two passages together. What Romans 9 says is God can bestow grace on whom he wishes. He will show mercy on whom he will, and he will harden whom he will. What 2 Peter 3 shows is that man is impatient with regard to the fulfillment of prophecy. He wants it fulfilled quickly, is what man does. But God is wiser than man. God has purposes that he is going to accomplish, and such, his timing is not the same as man's. So if we put those two principles together, we end up with what I'm going to call the, the great delay principle. And when I say delay, delay is from man's perspective, okay? Okay it's probably better called the great timing principle. It's not as if God ran into unanticipated traffic and arrived late, right? So delay is the, the man-centered view of things. In other words, God doesn't do things as fast as we would like, so it looks to us as a delay. But it's actually God's perfect timing given what he wants to accomplish. So here's a definition I'm going to use for today. The great delay principle is simply this. God sometimes chooses to delay the fulfillment of a prophecy in order to accomplish his purposes, often to bestow grace. God chooses to delay the fulfillment of a prophecy to accomplish his purposes, often to bestow grace. Get Isaiah chapter 30. I was preparing uh, for this message and talking with a great friend of mine, and uh, he said, you know, a great verse for you to use would be Isaiah 30, verse 18, and he was right. So take a look at this verse, if you would. Isaiah 30, verse 18. And therefore will the Lord wait. Why will the Lord wait? That he may be gracious unto you. When God waits, it's not because he lost his train of thought. It's not because he got distracted. He has a purpose to it. Very often, it is to show grace. So here are the four examples I want to cover this morning. The first is Noah. The second is Jonah and Nineveh. The third is the destruction of Satan and his angels. And fourth, is preterism and the dispensation of grace. So those are the four things we're going to cover. Let's start with Noah. Get 2 Peter chapter 2 and Genesis 6. 2 Peter chapter 2 and Genesis 6. 2 Peter chapter 2, and we'll begin in verse 5. 2 Peter 2 verse 5. Starting verse 4, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, notice, a preacher of righteousness. Noah was not simply a craftsman. He was not simply a shipbuilder. What was he? 
He was a preacher of righteousness. Get Genesis 6. Genesis 6. Genesis 6. And we'll look at verse 3. Genesis 6, verse 3. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. So if we put those two verses together, Noah was a preacher of righteousness. How long did he preach for? 120 years. You think your ministry is unfruitful? <laughs> what happened with Noah? How many converts did he have? Him, Mrs. Noah, his own sons, and their wives. So that was likely a frustrating ministry. Now think about this. When God tells Noah, build an ark, does God know he's going to flood the earth? Yes. Which tells you that the earth had earned that judgment. But God delays the judgment for 120 years. He knows what he's going to do. He knows they've earned it. But he gives mankind every possible chance to repent, doesn't he? If anyone the day before had gone up to Noah and said, Noah, do you have an extra spot on the ark? God would have made accommodation. That's an example of the delay principle there. You see that? In other words, the flood should have snuck up on no one, right? 120 years of preaching, this guy's building this enormous boat. It shouldn't have been a surprise. That's God's grace in action. He's delaying the judgment that is richly deserved because he wants to give man every chance to repent. But does God's justice ultimately have to be executed? Yes, his holiness demands it. It's not a coincidence that Methuselah is the longest lived person in the Bible, is it? It's indicative of God not rushing into judgment, him, God waiting and waiting and hoping that men will repent. Obviously most did not. Get Jonah chapter three. The second example is Jonah and Nineveh. Jonah and Nineveh. Get Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3, verse 4. Jonah chapter 3, verse 4. Jonah 3, 4. Now notice carefully what Jonah says in Jonah 3, verse 4. And Jonah began to enter into the city, that's Nineveh, a day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Notice what Jonah does not say. Jonah does not say, Repent or else Nineveh will be overthrown. He doesn't say, Get right or I will do this. He actually specifically says, 40 days, and it's going to happen. There's no escape clause mentioned in verse 4. There's no way out. There's no condition. Look at verse 9. This is what the king of Nineveh does. The king of Nineveh says, Who can tell if God will turn and repent? In other words, Jonah didn't mention this as an option, but you know what? If judgment's going to happen, shouldn't we... Turn and repent because maybe God will be long-suffering. That's what the king of Nineveh does. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And what happens when Nineveh does that? Verse 10. And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. Even though in verse 4, he unambiguously says, I'm going to destroy the place. Doesn't give him an out. Doesn't say I'm going to destroy it unless. He says, this is what I'm going to do. But when Nineveh repents, God in his graciousness decides what? I'm not going to fulfill this judgment at this time. Now, did God permanently abandon his plan to judge Nineveh? He didn't. There's a book about that, right? Nahum. 
Look with me at Jonah chapter 4. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. Verse 2, and he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God, and merciful, and slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Here's what Jonah says. I knew you were going to do this. <laughs> right? This is how you are. And that's why I didn't go. I went to Tarshish because I know your character. I know how you are. If these knuckleheads repent, you're going to let them off the hook. That's exactly what Jonah's saying. Verse 4, then said the Lord, doest thou well to be angry? Of course, the answer to that is no. Verse 9, now you, I'm going to skip for the sake of time, but God causes the gourd to grow up, and then he causes the gourd to perish. Verse 9, and God said to Jonah, doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry even unto death. Jonah's just mad, isn't he? You caused that gourd that I knew for all of 24 hours to disappear, and I'm irate, even unto death. Stomp. Right? Jonah's just greatly put out. Verse 10. Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd, for the which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand, how many is that? 120,000. Persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle. What God's saying there is, look, if I pour out this judgment on Nineveh, yeah, the city deserves it. But there are, going to be, are there going to be other people impacted by that? There's 120,000 there that obviously can't tell their right hand from the left hand. What he's saying is all those infants that are in there that are innocent, right, because they haven't yet grown up and adopted the ways of Nineveh, if I pour out the judgment that I'm going to pour out, it's going to impact them as well. And God says, I'm going to be long-suffering. And Jonah, like men often are, is like, well, I, I just don't agree with that, right? You should pour out judgment. They deserve it. Get with me Ezekiel 33. Ezekiel 33. God has a lot more grace than we do. Ezekiel 33, verse 11. Ezekiel 33, verse 11. Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? That's a great verse about how God thinks about things. Will God ultimately impose judgment on every being in the universe that deserves it? Yes. Would he prefer not to? Yes! And that's the magnitude of what Jesus Christ did. Jesus Christ made it possible so that no human has to undergo God's wrath. It's God's desire that they not do that. But when men reject that, his justice constrains him, and he has no choice but to ultimately impose that judgment. Let's look at the third example, the destruction of Satan and his angels. Get Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Genesis 3, 15. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee, that's the serpent, and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, what I want you to notice is, so if we go over here all the way to, to Genesis 3, when the serpent deceives Eve, God at that point in Genesis 3 declares what's going to happen to the serpent. He, he's decreed the judgment that's going to happen. But it's not fulfilled until over here, is it? I mean, God's decided what he's going to do. How's he going to destroy the serpent? 
with the seed of the woman, is that judgment absolutely certainly going to happen? No question about it, it will. But does it happen quickly? No, it doesn't. Look with me at John 8 and 1 John 3. John 8 and 1 John 3. John chapter 8, verse 44, John 8, 44. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. Notice, he was a murderer from the beginning. How quickly does Satan fall, does Lucifer fall after he's created? Pretty quickly. He's a murderer from the beginning. Look at 1 John 3. 1 John chapter 3. 1 John 3, verse 8. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. So let's think through the following issue. Satan sins from the beginning. It's in Genesis 3 that God decides the judgment he's going to impose, but he doesn't impose it for thousands of years. Why? Satan surely deserved it. Is there a lot of bad that has resulted from Satan's rebellion? There has. Get with me 1 Corinthians 2. I want to show you that there are some purposes that God has accomplished by allowing Satan to continue to roam free in the universe. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If in Genesis 3, God had destroyed Satan, if he'd immediately cast him in the lake of fire or disintegrated him or whatever, it would have demonstrated that God had the power to do that. It would not have necessarily demonstrated that God's wisdom was superior. So what God did is God simply kept the mystery a secret. Satan, in Luke 22, enters into Judas because Satan wants the cross to occur. God doesn't reveal anything at that point. Over here in the book of Acts, God gives Paul some information. And I don't know if you read the Message Bible. It's really great. But if you do, in the middle of the book of Acts, Satan says, oops, I'm kidding you. But isn't that actually what happens, more or less? In other words, at some point in the middle of the book of Acts, Satan realizes, oh, wow, I entered into Judas. I wanted this to happen. I was in favor of this. I thought this served my interest, and it was an absolute, utter mistake. And God didn't even tell him at the time. He just reveals it over here to Paul. Look at me at Ephesians 3. What I'm, what I'm suggesting to you about that is God demonstrated God's wisdom to be superior to Satan's wisdom. That wouldn't have been the case if God immediately cast Satan into the lake of fire. Look with me at Ephesians 3, verse 9. Now, this is a verse we all know by heart. I think sometimes we, we miss the emphasis of it. Ephesians 3, 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hitting God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. So our responsibility is to make all men see. If you look at how much of churchianity knows the mystery, we have a lot left to do, right? Now, the end of verse 9 is not a period. Notice what verse 10 says, to the intent. You actually make all men see because you're accomplishing a greater intent. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold Wisdom of God. So what happens as the body of Christ preaches the mystery, it actually is a communication, it is a demonstration to the principalities and powers in heavenly places, the manifold wisdom of God. 
So I'm going to suggest to you this is what happens. Satan comes to understand the mystery and realizes, wow, this was an enormous mistake. And as the body of Christ preaches the mystery, the manifold wisdom of God, all the angels that followed him realize, well, we are on the wrong team. God's wisdom is superior to Satan's. There's no getting us back. This, uh, to use the King James language, stinketh. <laughs> right? Now, by the way, if you ever wonder why Satan hates the mystery, why there aren't more people that are dispensationalists, how, does, how do the principalities and powers in the heavenly places feel about your message? They don't hate Calvinism. They don't hate lordship salvation. There's a million things they don't hate. But the word of God rightly divided, which demonstrates God's wisdom to be superior, they detest. Right? So part of allowing Satan to roam free is it allows the demonstration, the proof to the universe. God's wisdom is superior, and it's a declaration unto those in rebellion. Now look with me at Isaiah 10. There's another principle as to why I, b I believe that Satan was allowed to roam free for a period of time. And that principle is this. God uses the wicked to accomplish his purposes, which the wicked are all too often happy to help with. In other words, God uses the wicked to accomplish what he wants, and the wicked are often happy about helping with that. So look with me at Isaiah chapter 10, verse 5. O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger, and the staff in their hand is mine indignation. I will send him against an hypocritical nation, and against the people of my wrath will I give him a charge to take the spoil and to take the prey and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. So God addresses the Assyrian, the man, and what does he call him? The rod of my indignation. In other words, you're a stick. You're a stick that I have a purpose for. I'm going to use you as a tool of my wrath. Look with me at verse 12. Wherefore, when it shall come to pass that when the Lord hath performed his whole work upon Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, I will punish the fruit of the stout heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his high looks. For he saith, by the strength of my hand I have done it, and by my wisdom, for I am prudent. Whenever someone has to tell you how smart they are, it's normally an indication that maybe not. And I have removed the bounds of the people and have robbed their treasures, and I have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man. You see the point? Here's what the Assyrian does. The Assyrian is going to pour out his wrath on Israel, right? He's going to execute judgment. He's going to conquer them. And he, he imagines in himself, I'm a valiant man, and I've got this great plan, and I'm powerful, and I'm great, right? And God says, you know what you are. You're a stick that I'm choosing to wield. You're not anything great. And by the way, when I'm done with you, I'm going to punish you. Right? Isn't that what he said? Verse 15, Shall the axe boast itself against him that heweth therewith? Or shall the saw magnify itself against him that shaketh it? As if the rod should shake itself against them that lift it up, or as if the staff should lift up itself as if it were no wood. Therefore shall the Lord, the Lord of hosts, send among his fat ones leanness, and under his glory he shall kindle a burning fire, a burning like the burning of a fire. And I'll just, I'll just read to you Isaiah 30, 31. For through the voice of the Lord shall the Assyrian be beaten down, which smote with a rod. A similar thing happens with Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is lifted up with pride, and so what does God do? He afflicts him with madness, and, and Nebuchadnezzar runs out and eats grass like an ox. See, here's what happens. As men, we are way too arrogant, and we have the fallacy, the prideful foolishness that, look, I'm smart, and I'm tough, and I'm powerful, and I'm going to go conquer this, and I'm going to do that, and, and all these worldly things I have are by my intelligence and wisdom and design. And what is the truth? The truth is, 
What you have, you have by God's permission. The Assyrian is just this stick, this garden implement he picked up at Lowe's, and he's going to use it for a period of time, and then when he's done with it, he's going to punish him for his prideful arrogance. That's what happens with the Assyrian. Now, I want you to notice something. The same thing happens with Satan and his minions. Get Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1, verse 6. Job chapter 1, verse 6. Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Now, I think some people sometimes have the idea that what Satan is today is Satan is the king of hell. And so he's down in hell, and he's got a throne, and he drinks beer, and he runs things, <laughs> and it's his domain, right? Because Satan is the king of hell, and he's in charge. No, that's not what it is at all. What's happening with Satan today is he still reports to God. You can see that in Job 1, verse 6. What happened is God basically had a status meeting of his direct reports, and Satan had to show up. He had to give account. And the point is, Satan's, Satan's role in the universe continues to be subject to God's pleasure. In other words, he has to account for what he's doing. Look with me at 1 Kings chapter 22. 1 Kings chapter 22. First Kings chapter 22, and look at verse 20. And the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this manner, and another said on that manner. God's having a discussion here with his direct reports. Verse 21, And there came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? How are you going to do that? And he said, I will go forth, and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, Thou shalt persuade him, and prevail also. Go forth and do so. Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets, and the Lord hath spoken evil concerning thee. What's happening there, obviously, is there's an angel in rebellion the fallen one, he, he's a lying spirit, and he says, here's what I'll do. I will go do this at Ramoth Gilead, and I will help Lord accomplish your purpose. He's actually volunteering to do that is what, is what he's doing, isn't he? And, and the point is that what God is doing is God is using the rebellious creatures in his universe to accomplish purposes that he wants. He wanted Ahab to go up there and fall, and he's going to use this lying spirit to do that. Now think about something with me if you would. Prior to Paul, prior to Paul, there is nothing in the scriptures about how God is going to reconcile the heavenlies. And what I mean by that is this. So before the serpent ends up on earth, there's obviously been a rebellion in heaven. And it's clear that when Satan rebels, a number of the leading principalities and powers in heavenly places rebel with him. Job says the heavens are not clean in his sight. And so the issue that happens is the heavens, from this point on, have the problem of there's this rebellion going on in the heavens. There, there's, there's wickedness there. There's Satan and his angels, and they have rebelled against God the Father's authority. You can read Genesis all the way up to Acts 7, and there's no clue about how God resolves that problem. There, there's nothing that, that explains it. I want you to think about something about how perfect God's timing is. So here's what God does during the dispensation of grace. He selects people to be members of the body of Christ. And he selects them by whether or not they have faith in Christ, right? So someone believes the gospel, they get into the body of Christ. So God forms this body. Then at the catching up, he gives them new spiritual bodies so they can function in heavenly places. So now they're capable of operating in the heavenly realm. And after the catching up, they then go through the judgment seat of Christ. 
And the purpose of the judgment seat of Christ is to reward believers according to their service, but it also has this effect. When you study the rewards in Paul's writings, they often are described as crowns. And so what God does is this. He has the problem of there's this rebellion going on up here. And these different authorities have rebelled, and I'm not going to let them be there for all eternity. So what he does, he forms the replacement. He equips them at the catching up with the bodies to function in the heavenlies. They go through the judgment seat of Christ and receive their assignments. And at that point in time, thousands of years from this, God has fully formed Satan's replacement. Right? They're ready to go. Now, by the way, think about this. And you, you, this falls in the category of, you know, you can ignore this or believe it or whatever. The judgment seat of Christ, which involves every believer since Paul first got in the body of Christ, right? There's millions of people. That could take a period of time, couldn't it? I wonder if it doesn't last exactly until the middle of Daniel's 70th week. Get Revelation 12. Get Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out that old serpent called the devil and Satan which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So what I personally believe is the case, nature abhors a vacuum. God didn't want those positions to be vacant. He was going to accomplish things with the rebellious authorities in those positions. But as soon as he formed the perfect replacement, he had no more need of them. Right? So the body of Christ is caught up, gets their new bodies, goes through the judgment seat of Christ. Decide for yourself whether or not this is true. The judgment seat of Christ is completed. The body of Christ has received their assignments. He turns to Michael, and Michael says, I know what you're going to say. Say it! <laughs> right? In other words, I've been waiting for this for 6,000 years. Give me permission! Right? And he says to Michael, and Michael says, yes, sir, right? Yeah. And he proceeds to eject Satan and his angels from the heaven. Now tell me, isn't God's timing perfect? Right? Sure, he could have destroyed them over here, but instead he's using their rebellion to accomplish his purposes. And once they've accomplished what God wants, now you're done. See that? Now look at Revelation 12, verse 12. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you having great wrath, notice, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Wasn't true over here. There were things God yet had to accomplish. But it's become painfully clear at this point right? God's formed the replacement for Satan and his angels. He doesn't need them in the heavenlies. He's cast down to earth. Does he know the clock is ticking? Yes, he does. He has great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. God has very few things left for him to accomplish. Get with me Revelation chapter 20. So at this point, in the middle of the 70th week, Satan is cast down to the earth. We know then the great tribulation occurs. And then at the second coming, let's notice what happens in Revelation 20, verse 3. And cast him into the bottomless pit, that's Satan, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. So the Lord Jesus Christ is going to establish the millennial kingdom. Satan is going to be shut up. I wonder if, that, if the phrase shut up comes from that because he's, 
He's put in the bottomless pit and sealed so he can't deceive. In other words, you, you know, you shut up. I've heard enough from you, right? But it says that he has to be loosed for what? A little season. Look at verse 7 and verse 8. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Here's what I think that's telling you. Satan's bound in the bottomless pit. He's given liberty only for a little season to accomplish a specific purpose that God wanted accomplished. And here's what I'm going to suggest it is. During the millennial kingdom, Jesus Christ rules with a rod of iron, right? It's possible to go outside Jerusalem and look down through a portal and see people that are in hell because they have defied the Lord Jesus Christ, right? So judgment occurs, and the people saying hell doesn't exist, there's, a, there's, a, there's few of them at that time, right? Hell exists, you can see it. There's Bob. Bob rebelled before, and that's what the Lord did, right? Now, here's what's going to happen under that environment. There will be men in the hardness of their hearts that resent the Lord Jesus Christ and hate His rule, right? Because men are always hateful. But it's clear as can be, you don't want to mess with that guy, right? The last time someone did, he just threw him down into the hell. So here's what Satan's purpose is. You ready? The reason he has to be loosed for a little season is this. God uses him as an instrument to go out and reveal the hearts of men that would really rather rebel against the Lord Jesus Christ than submit to his authority. So he goes out to the nations of the earth, and what do they do? They follow him. You know, you sort of think someone should have said, hey, listen, the last time someone had this idea, blood flowed for 200 miles, right? Remember, it flows at the level of a horse's bridle for 200 miles. Someone over here should say, hey, hey, time out. You're about to do something really dumb. You need to rethink this. But what they do, of course, is they go up to Jerusalem and they encompass it. They surround it. We're not going to let him get away. We're going to kill him. God says, okay, I got you where I want you. <laughs> And he incinerates him, right? So Satan's role there was, go, go ahead, Satan, go out there and deceive the nations of the earth. Bring them. What you're going to do is you're going to reveal their hearts, and that's your purpose. What happens immediately after that? Verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. See, Satan just performed in, in 7 and 8, his last act of service. God has no further need of him because God is now going to move forward to the new heavens and the new earth, and there's no need for Satan in, in that. So at that point in time, he and his rebellion has completed his final purpose. He's cast into the lake of fire. So what I'm going to suggest to you is God's timing is perfect, right? Satan's cast down into, into the lake of fire once God has accomplished everything he wants to accomplish with him. All right, let's look at the fourth example. Preterism and the dispensation of grace. So preterism has been growing in recent years, and let's just first define what it is and then talk about it. Preterism comes from the Latin word praetor, meaning past. And what preterism is is it's the view that the prophecies of the Gospels and Revelation were fulfilled during the first century. So in other words, if you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there's all kinds of prophecies in there. There's all sorts of prophecies in the book of Revelation. Preterism views all of those prophecies as having been fulfilled during the first century. Look with me at Matthew 24, verse 34. There are several proof verses that preterists use. I'm going to pick just one that I think is, is one of their more... If they had a good point, this would be it. Matthew 24, verse 34. Verily I say unto you, 
this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. So in other words, if you look in the context of Matthew 24, this generation, the one that's being addressed there, cannot pass till all these things be fulfilled. Well, notice, for example, go to verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And so what the preterists will do with that is they'll say, well, you know, there was a blood moon at that time, and there was an earthquake, and there was this, that, and the other. And so all those things were fulfilled in the first century. But look at verse 30. Verse 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. That's the second coming, isn't it? Well, did the second coming happen during the first century? I mean, obviously not. So preterism can't be right. In other words, it can't be, it's just simply not the case that those events occurred during the first century. But then, what's the answer to that? So I, I want to use th this chart here just for a minute. John Versagan was kind enough to um, let me take his chart and then eliminate the dispensation of grace. The reason I want to look at this chart for a minute is I want you to think, if you're right before the cross, which is where Matthew 24 would have been, if you're right before the cross, I want to think about what people then would expect based upon the prophetic timetable. So here's my first question. If you're the cross, Matthew 24, 34, what's the minimum time under the prophecy program until the second coming can happen? Well, it's got to be seven years, right? So Matt Walker covered that yesterday, right? In other words, Daniel's 70th week has to happen there's also a, a prophetic gap that has to take place. Uh, Luke 13 talks about the fig tree in another year. So let's just call that seven plus years. In other words, if you're right before the cross, the second coming can't happen any earlier than seven plus years. So we all get that. That's, that's pretty simple. Let me ask you a different question. What is the maximum time? So in other words, let's say you're right before the cross, okay? Right before the cross... and you don't know about the dispensation of grace. So right before the cross, not taking into account the dispensation of grace, what's the maximum time until the second coming? Do we know an answer to that? I'm going to suggest that we do. Get Numbers 32. Numbers chapter 32. Numbers 32. Now I'm going to show you how I understand how to deal with, with this passage. And, you know, there's other folks, there are other points of view, and I'm just going to show you what I understand. You can take it for what it's worth. Numbers 32, verse 13. And the Lord's anger was kindled against Israel, and he made them wander in the wilderness 40 years, and then notice what it says, until all the generation that had done evil in the sight of the Lord was consumed. So in other words, what's going on there is Israel doesn't want to enter the promised land. They, they have a, an attitude of unbelief, and they, they look at the giants and they say, we don't want to do that. And God's response to that is the folks that were adults, in other words, that had made the decision, we're scared of going into the land, you're going to wander for 40 years till that generation can die out. That's the punishment. You don't want to trust me and go into the land? Don't go. That's really what's happening there, right? And it's fascinating that it's 40 years. Look with me at Psalm 95. Psalm chapter 95. Psalm 95, verse 10. Psalm 95, verse 10. 
40 years long was I grieved with, notice the language here, this generation. That's the same terminology used in Matthew. This generation shall not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. So what I'm going to suggest to you is this. If you're right before the cross in Matthew 24, the minimum to the second coming is seven plus years, but the maximum, this generation shall not pass away till all these things be fulfilled is 40 years. The second coming should have happened within 40 years of the Lord speaking that. So the Bible has errors, we're all done. No. You've already seen the answer. What did God say would happen in 40 days in Nineveh? He said it'd be destroyed, but it didn't happen, did it? It didn't happen because God decided to interpose grace. Right? Now, if you think about Acts 2, it won't take time to prove this, but in Acts 2, Peter says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Joel's all about the tribulation. In other words, the prophetic time clock is ticking. It's going on and on and on and on, right? Until we know that God decided to interrupt the prophetic calendar. What I would tell you is this. The answer to the problem of preterism is understanding God's great delay principle. The most profound example of the great delay principle is God interrupting the prophetic program for 2,000 years for the purpose of bestowing grace on Gentiles. That's what he did, right? I mean, in other words, think about this. Get with me, um, get with me Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 34. Acts 2, 34. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. In Acts 2, the Lord is sitting, but not permanently. He's sitting until he will make his foes his footstool. In Acts 7, you know the answer to this. What does Stephen see? The Son of Man standing. So what's happened is, Acts 2, Jesus Christ is seated. Acts 7, he's standing. What's he about to do? He's about to make his foes his footstool, right? The prophetic clock has moved on. It hasn't been set aside just yet at that time. Get with me Revelation 19. Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. Revelation 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven open. By the way, Stephen saw heaven open in Acts 7, if you remember. And behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Now you know this. Paul, at the beginning of every epistle, says... Grace and peace. When Stephen sees the heaven open and he sees Jesus Christ standing, what is about to come is judgment and war. And God says, instead of war, I'm going to give you a time of peace. Instead of judgment, I'm going to give you a time of grace. And so every single one of Paul's epistles is a reminder. The great incredible fact of our existence today is that although we should have been destroyed, God has extended the period of time and given us a time of grace and peace. Get with me, 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering. Another great description of what the delay principle is, is it's the long-suffering principle. I am interrupting the clock there. <laughs> the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish 
but that all should come to repentance. Verse 15, and account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. See, Peter comes to understand that the putting of the prophecy on program, the prophecy program on hold is, is God's long suffering and it should be accounted as salvation. That's the answer to preterism. All right, so I'm going to give you some bonus material. Are you ready? Get John chapter 11. Now, while you're turning there, so the great delay principle, friends, simply is this. God chooses to delay the fulfillment of a prophecy in order to accomplish His purposes, often to bestow grace. The most profound demonstration of that is the dispensation of grace itself. Praise the, praise the Lord that God did that for us. What I want to show you just, this is like, you know how you watch the movie and then afterwards like there's a little scene? This is like the little <laughs> bonus material. Now, you may decide that it's the bloopers, but I'm going to hope you view it as just bonus content. Get John chapter 11. And the question I want to give you a hint about is this. How long is the dispensation of grace? Now, what happens is there's people that set dates all the time, and they say it's going to happen here, and it's going to happen because of the blood moon, and there's all sorts of irresponsible foolishness, and, and you, you should be involved with none of that. But I want to show you something that I think is worth thinking about. John chapter 11, verse 6. And, and I'm going to call this simply the two days principle. John chapter 11, verse 6. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Then after that, saith he to his disciples, let us go into Judea again. Verse 15. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent ye may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. In John 11, what the Lord does is he delays going to Lazarus for two days. And he does that, he says, for the purpose that they would believe. Get Hosea 6, and I'm just going to read it to you. Hosea 6, verse 1. Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. Hosea 6, 2. After two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. John chapter 4, verse 40. I'm just going to read this to you. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. Now after two days he departed thence and went unto Galilee. So in John 4, the Lord spends two days outside of Israel before coming back to Israel. Now 2 Peter 3, 8, I'm sure you're familiar with this. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. And by the way, that's the same chapter that tells us to account the long-suffering of our Lord as salvation. So there's, there's, a, there's a passage that says God withdraw, the Lord delays himself two days so that they might believe. There's another passage that says that he hath torn, but he will then receive them again. And there's another passage that says two days he leaves Israel and then comes back to it. What's here to hear? 4,000 years. So far, this is 2,000 years. This is the hardest one. How long's that? 1,000. Isn't the millennial rest sort of symbolic of the Sabbath? It's just possible that God's timing is perfect, right? And that the dispensation of grace, and, I, and listen, some, someone's going to say that I'm saying it's happening on Tuesday, and that's not what I'm saying. But I don't think the dispensation of grace is going to be 10,000 years. I don't think that fits with the scriptural pattern. It fits with a 2,000-year pattern that's consistent with those other verses. Thank you for your indulgence. Father, we thank you for your time. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your perfect word. We thank you that you saw fit to withhold the judgment that this earth deserved. And we as Gentiles richly deserved your judgment for, for a multitude of reasons. We thank you that you've given us the dispensation of grace. We thank you that you've given us salvation by grace freely. We thank you for eternal security. We thank you for each day that this dispensation extends, that we might do the work that you would have us to do, that you might be glorified. Help us, Lord, to be busy about proclaiming the gospel of grace that people might be saved. Pray, Lord, that you would accomplish all that you choose to accomplish through us. In Jesus' name, amen.